Well, I'm standing here, I'm taller than you. And I want you to understand that I can see each and every one of you. I can see the whites of the eyes. So if you start getting like this, I'll know. This um, is number 19 in the series. And next week we have the last. It's an important one. It deals with the remnant church and the spirit of prophecy, and the two are connected. It's an amazing organization that we really belong to. Let us start with the story of Elijah, an artist impression here of Elijah being fed by the ravens. Now, I don't know what ravens have done for you in your life, but they've never fed me. They've dropped things, but they have never, it's never been food. Remarkable thing is, the man Elijah, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, was commissioned to tell the king that there would be no more rain. But by my word, he said. He barged into the, temp- into the palace, looked totally out of place, <clears throat> said it to the king, walked out again, unopposed, unchallenged, and of course, the rains didn't come. And then they blamed him. There's a lot to be learned about the story of Elijah, because a lot of it applies to us. And God kept him for three and a half years, and he fed him for three and a half years. Very significant. Now, you would know Elijah from the Mount Carmel experience. There at Mount Carmel, there was an issue. And the issue that was to be settled there was this issue. Who is God? Who is God? Do you know it's interesting that there was only a choice of two. Either it is Baal, Baal, or it was God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How long will you falter between two opinions? Do you know that that is going to be an issue at the end time, where we are? It will culminate in a simple choice of two possibilities. Like in the days of Elijah, how long will you falter? In other words, how long are you going to stay on the fence? If the Lord is God, follow him. But Baal, well, follow him. And he made a test. He says, I will, you will call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of my Lord, and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Now you know the story. They danced around, mutilated themselves, yelled and screamed, performed for hours on end, and nothing happened. And then Elijah, he doused that altar with its sacrifice, filled the trench with water. He knelt down, actually, called on the name of the Lord, and fire came down in such a power. The fire, the fire consumed the sacrifice. It consumed the altar and all the water. If ever you truly call on God, be ready to receive the power. God hasn't changed. And he answered. And of course, all the Baal prophets were killed. And of course, the people said, the Lord, he is God. By the way, the name Eli Yahu. Eli is my God. Yah is the abbreviator of Yahweh, the personal name of God. Who is he? Yahweh, my God. Yahweh is he. He is my God. That's the issue of the controversy here at the time of Elijah. Now, Elijah is therefore a very important principle, that is, his ministry. If you go to the book of Malachi, it's the last book written of the Old Testament, about 400 B.C. And Malachi means my messenger. It's a very suitable Title. I want you to see what it's written in this third chapter, verse 1. Behold, 
God says through this prophet, Behold, I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. This is God speaking. By the way, this is the same one who came, who became man incarnate. He says, my messenger will come before me and he will prepare the way. That's what he said. Now, when you go to the next chapter of the book of Malachi, you have this statement. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now, Elijah the prophet had his ministry about 850, 860 BC. This is written 450 years later. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, my question to you. Is there a difference between verse 1 of chapter 3 and verse 5 of chapter 4? Yes, there is. Because the dreadful, the great and dreadful day of the Lord is not the first coming of Jesus. Are you with me? He would send his messenger before him to prepare the way of the Lord. That applies to the first coming. Are you understanding? Some 400 and something years later, that is what happened. Oh yes, we're coming to that. But here, clearly, this is the second coming. So there is an Elijah movement. Round about 850, 860 BC, he has his ministry on Mount Carmel, and he settles the issue. There is an Elijah figure at the first coming of Jesus, and there is an Elijah movement right at the end of the world history as we know it. Is everybody clear about this? Because if you're not, you can say so. Not too often, but you can, you know. It's all right. Now, the man, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. His name is Zachariah, which means God remembered. And when in the Hebrew that verb is used, you can almost imply God acts. And God is going to act here. Because there is going to be a messenger. And the angel Gabriel has this conversation with this rather slow of believing elderly man who does not believe he's got it in him, let alone his wife, to have a child. But he did. And he talks about him and he says, he will also, referring to the son, he will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. You understand? He didn't say Elijah. He said in the power, in the spirit of Elijah. Is that all clear to you? I'm standing so high. You're so far down. I can hardly see you now. <laughs> okay. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. There is going to be a messenger, and that messenger is going to come in the spirit of Elijah. Have a look at this. So, knowing what Malachi wrote and putting the first and the second advent of Jesus together, and of course, knowing the name of Elijah, that he should be here, the, the Pharisees walked up to John and they said to him, Are you Elijah? And he said, No, I'm not. That's all he said. And they didn't get it. If he was not Elijah, then certainly he couldn't be the Messiah anyway because he was the messenger, but then, and he already had denied that, then who is he there for? They couldn't quite work it out. When ultimately he was executed, Jesus spoke of him. And he said to his disciples, because the early disciples knew John the Baptist, he said, but what did you go out to see a prophet, yes, I say to you, and much, much more than a prophet. And then he refers, in the second person, he refers now, the, the recipient being the second person, namely himself, he refers to Malachi 3, chapter 3, verse 1. He says, for it is 
he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. This is the messenger. And so we can deduct from here something very important. He says to his disciples, if you are willing to accept this, what I just said, if you are willing to accept it, he, John the Baptist, is Elijah who was supposed to come. Are you with me here? Do you understand what Jesus is saying here? Folks? Good, excellent, excellent. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. This is a very famous saying, meaning you take notice of what's being said here. Very important. Now, my messenger is John the Baptist here, and clearly my messenger in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And that is what we look for at the second coming. Now, we've got to work out what that is. In fact, I asked a question at the Sabbath school. When did the Christian church start? And we said, well, Pentecost. And I said, no, they were up in the upper room, 10 uh, Christ-accepting, believing, following people. They were in the upper room for 10 days. So, no, no, it was that at least 10 days before. In fact, it probably started with John the Baptist. Because he told his disciples to follow who? Jesus. He said, that's him. Follow him. He is the one. And so, the church, the Christian church, we studied Revelation chapter 12. The woman standing on the moon. The garland of the 12 stars. The virtuous woman, the church of God, in the wilderness for 1260 years. 538, 1798 A.D. You know, those prophecies, they may seem to you sometimes like quite a headache to grasp and to get them into your mind. Can I say to you, my friends, it is worth it? Please make the effort. If you, if you study for anything at all, you have to make an effort, correct? And of course, so it is. So it is here with the Bible prophecies. The church in the wilderness, it's a very interesting thing when you look at it. The church survived. The stories of the Waldenses, and of course there are so many, the Moravians, uh, so many other groups that were so heroic in their beliefs and in their consistency of following the Bible and following Christ as they saw it. The Pilgrim Fathers and the, and the Moravians that later on followed them as well that went there to America to find a place where they could worship in freedom. No Pope and no King. And so the, the church in the wilderness, of course, survived. And as God protected Elijah for three and a half literal years, it is a fact that the, the, the church in the wilderness, his true church, was protected for some three and a half prophetic years, namely 1260 years. Are you understanding the comparison here, folks? Now, what is the Elijah message for today? What would you expect it to teach, to preach? Well, most certainly it would be a revival, wouldn't it? It would tell you to return to God, to the true God. Is that correct? You would expect that. And so to depart from false worship, the Bible over traditions, folks. The Bible is the guide. That is what we go by. To uphold the commandments of God. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep the commandments. Correct? And so here, here you would definitely expect an Elijah movement to be a movement that keeps all the commandments of God uh, and that would preach what John preached, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for except at the end time, the Elijah movement preparing the way for the Lord has a present day truth about the kingdom, namely the last empire. You see, it's made up out of people, correct? And there's a judgment going on in heaven. We'll come back to that. There is a judgment going on in heaven that is decided who are going to be included in that kingdom of heaven. You're familiar with that. 
And so the last thing that you would certainly put here as well would be preparation for his coming. How important that indeed is. These people have to be prepared. Now John sees in vision, and in vision there in the 10th chapter of the book of Revelation is a very interesting scenario. I want you to follow this. John is actually looking virtually into heaven at times. And then there is a time when an angel comes down, a very particular, a very mighty angel. And this angel, this angel, that mighty angel coming down from heaven, closed with a cloud. Now, this is not an atmospheric cloud. These are billions of angels at a distance looking like a cloud. This is a divine attribute. The one he is talking about is the one we know as Christ, as God. And a rainbow was on his head, his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. What a description. He is trying to give an expression of the tremendous celestial being that he sees, and he's having difficulties finding the words. He had a little book open in his hand. It's emphatic in the Greek that that little book is open. It is significant for it to be open. Now, when you read the whole Bible, you can virtually understand it, even at the time when that was written. But there was one little book in the Bible, the Old Testament, of which a number of portions were very hard to understand. And the prophet Daniel pleaded with God to understand what God got him to write down. And there in the 12th chapter, God, when Daniel tried again to get the explanation. God said, leave it alone, Daniel. It is until the time of the end. And I could give you a Bible study on when the time on the end begins. It's after that persecution of 1260 years. It starts after 1798. What is remarkable that Daniel in the 6th century BC was told that this little booklet or portions of that, that which he couldn't understand would only be understood right towards the latter part, the closing part, if you like, the time of the end of this world's history. Are you guys following me here still? Excellent, excellent. He had a little book open in his hand, and then, and then now John has a proactive role. John here now personifies the church of the time of the end. He's getting a commission. And the commission that he's getting is this one. Go take the little book out of the, which is open. There is the emphasis again. Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. Standing on the sea and the earth means he is the owner of the whole world. This is God. This is the creator. And he's bidden to go to God, if you like, this angel, and so I went to this angel and I said to him, give me the little book. And so he said to me, take it, eat it, and I want you to see what he says. It'll make your stomach bitter, but... It will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. We are looking for an end time movement that goes through the experience that when you eat something, it comes in the mouth first. It's nice. But then in the stomach, it becomes a bitter experience. In fact, books, you don't eat books, you read them. But we have a saying, he or she devours books. They read them. The eating here has a connotation. You are what you eat. Is that correct? You have to inter internalize the message 
of that portion of the book of Daniel, which was closed and has a significant meaning right at the end time. That is what it comes down to. And the prediction is that an end time movement will go through the motion of having a wonderful, sweet experience and then a disappointing, bitter experience. We got to look at history to give that a placement. So he took the little book out of the angel's hand and he ate it. And sure enough, it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. And then, of course, when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. He is now living out the prediction made, mind you, in 95, 96 AD to be fulfilled towards the end of the history of this planet. Quite amazing. He said to me, and this is a pivotal statement, you, you look for a movement that goes through the sweet, bitter experience. And then this movement is bidden, this movement is told to do what? To prophesy? What's the next word? In other words, you have prophesied it. It was a bitter experience, although initially sweet as honey. But you are bidden to teach it again. And now I wish I had an extra hour. I could take you to the 11th chapter because there it is spelled out about measuring the sanctuary. But there's a constraint of time. The message will have to be given again after, of course, this disappointment and something has become very clear, a key factor. And we'll talk about that. <coughs> the first angel's message, Revelation 14. Give glory to God for one reason. The hour of his judgment has come. And we are reminded that he is the creator. At a time when man is doubting that there is such a thing as a creator God, we are reminded to turn back to God. That's an Elijah message. An Elijah message stands up for creation. And all the evidence points to that. There's a global judgment announced. Now, judgment is a significant thing in the Hebrew ordinances of services there in the sanctuary. We come back to that. Daniel, let's go back in time. Let's go back some 700 years. He has seen visions. He's seen the Medo-Persian ram. He has seen the goat. He has seen the horn power in its two phases, pagan and papal. And now he sees the the, the, in some way or another, he sees the sanctuary in God's people being trodden underfoot, and he wants to know how long this is going to last. And one of the celestial beings that is there in vision, as it were, reads his mind and, and, and regurgitates what's already going in the mind of Daniel. He says, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be what? It's a very interesting word here, nitztak. It's in the passive word form here. The sanctuary is the recipient. You see, a cleansing of a sanctuary, in brief, is simply this. As the sinner would go to the sanctuary, as there would be sacrifices on behalf of a repentant people, the records of the sin would go into the inside, into that little building, the sanctuary. And it became, as it were, the record of the sins that were confessed. Now, they couldn't stay there because they don't belong there. And once a year, there was a Yom Kippur, and it was decided that those confessed sins should be removed, should be cleansed by clean blood of the Lord's goat, over whose head no sins were confessed, and that the whole sanctuary would be cleansed from the record of the confessed and forgiven sins. Did you follow that? The sins that are not confessed and not forgiven are still with the sinner. We're not talking about that. 
We're talking about the confessed sins. And so what happened, the sanctuary would be cleansed. Now, when you do that, you need to have a look at two things. One, is the sinner committed to Christ? Is the sinner committed to God? Has there been a genuine repentance, an honest surrender? And if that is the case, then God is justified to have those sins removed. Do you understand this? That's the criteria here. Now, cleansing involves a judgment. And so the portable temple, the Solomonic temple, the Zerubbabel temple, which later became the Herodic temple, all have the same principle. It was a type. The Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment was a type. The anti-type found place at the culmination of the 2,300 years. Now, what have we got here? We have a year-day principle. The earthly sanctuary was cleansed yearly, but at the time, at the time of this prophecy, there was no earthly sanctuary. The earthly sanctuary was in ruins. Since 586 B.C., it lied in ruins. This prophecy in Daniel 8, you can, you can absolutely date 548 B.C. You see, the, 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 the temple has been in ruin for decades. And 2,300 days are not going to give you another temple because the Zerubbabel temple was initiated in 516 B.C. You can see that a, a application of days doesn't fit here. We understand, therefore, as most commentators do, uh, without any reservation, that we are dealing with actual 2,300 years because it is an apocalyptic prophecy. Are you with me here? Good. Now, having said that, having said that, question. What sanctuary is going to be cleansed? The answer well, it's not an earthly one because the earthly one was destroyed, ultimately rebuilt, but destroyed in 70 AD. Therefore, uh, it can't be because 2,300 years takes you way beyond, almost to our own time. You would have to talk about a sanctuary not of this world, which is exactly what the Bible speaks on. If you read the Pauline writings, the writings of Paul in his letters to the Hebrew, you can hear him Spell it out. There is a heavenly sanctuary where Jesus ministers on our behalf. And so clearly it is a judgment phase, a cleansing phase of all recorded forgiven sins in the heavenly sanctuary itself. Can you see the connection now between the cleansing and the judgment, the hour of the judgment? Because fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come deals with the time when that judgment, that investigative pre-advent judgment finds place in heaven. Now what is so beautiful about the book of Daniel is this. The culmination of the 2,300 years leads to that judgment. It's very interesting that the Jews had a probationary time. Can you see that? 490 years. You deduct that from there, you will get a leftover of 1810 years. You know, all you have to do is get a beginning date. Because if you look at the 490 plus the 1810, of course, that's 2,300 years. The Jewish, what shall I say, dispensation or or, or, or time left for them as a probation was the 490 years, which was cut off of the longer portion. We dealt with that in the past. And therefore, the 490 years and the 2,300 years have exactly the same beginning. And we learned, set in concrete, absolute concrete, not just biblical, but from the archaeological records, the starting date is 457 B.C. with the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The temple was already there, the Zerubbabel Temple, for quite a while. 
And then we looked at the culmination of that 490 years, 34 AD, I reminded you of the Gallio stone that would indicate when Paul stood there as they stoned Stephen, when that probation for the Jewish people came to an end. So all I have left is 1810 years, 34 plus 18 and 10 brings you to 1844, which is the day of judgment in the heavenly judgment, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the antitypical Yom Kippur, and clearly the announcement relates to that of the first angel, the hour of his judgment has come. Is everybody clear on this? I'd like to think you are. It takes me ages to put this together. It really does. But <clears throat> you need to see this. People sometimes say, well, how do you know this? How do you know? Well, I know. I, I study the word. And then I let the Bible interpret itself. And then I see the truth as it is. And I think to myself, this is a marvelous thing. God lets us know. He lets us know. This man here, William Miller, he was a military man. He retired. He was a farmer. And then he studied the Bible. He started from the beginning. The book of Daniel fascinated him. And he could see. He could see. He studied the time frame that you and I are studying right here or just repeated here on the previous slide. The thing was, William Miller came to a conclusion. And the conclusion was that at the culmination of the 2,300 years, Christ would come back and cleanse the earth because he believed the earth and the sanctuary were one and the same thing. And it wasn't just him who made that mistake. It wasn't just him. He saw wonderful visions. Uh, you, you know, he, well, then I say visions. He saw wonderful realities and truth. And the Advent movement was born. And the Advent movement took place in various places all around the world. You know what is interesting? This little, this little sketch here. Scandinavia, you see, was a Lutheran church. And you couldn't preach unless you were an adult. And if you went against the standard doctrine of the Lutheran church, you'd be thrown in jail. The phenomenon that occurred here in the Scandinavian countries, mainly amongst the poorer classes, was this, that children of eight, nine, as young as, as ten, would get up and preach with a capacity way beyond their years. They would give an exposition on the time prophecy of Daniel. You couldn't perhaps even do it. They did. Eight, nine, ten. They spoke to those people who went to these meetings. They say it was wonderful. It was like the spirit got possession of those kids. And they just stood. They put them on a table like that or on a chair. And off they went and told them, a judgment is coming. And everybody thought, the end of this world. There was a man by the name of Joseph Wolf. I would like to spend an hour on that man. If ever you want to feel humble, study the ministry of Joseph Wolf. An incredible man. What a missionary. Taught the second coming. Manuel de la Cunza, Henry Winter, Drummonds, all the others, wholly independent of one and another, taught the same story. The culmination of the 2,300 years, Jesus is coming back. That's what they taught. But that led to a great disappointment. They worked out the very date, the date of the Yom Kippur in 1844. They had that correct. And they waited all day. They'd sold their businesses. They'd given away Crops were still in the field. They couldn't be bothered. Jesus was coming. They made peace with one and another. It was a wonderful experience. People were excited. People were living, living for each other. It was interdenominational, hundreds of thousands. But then Jesus didn't come. And you can imagine 
You can imagine the ridicule. Huh? The next day. Still here, are we? Oh, told you. You understand? That was a bitter experience. But you know there were a people who said this, including William Miller. The Bible cannot be wrong. Their computation was correct. But the interpretation that that date pointed to a second coming and have the earth destroyed and cleansed by fire was incorrect. It was the second phase in the heavenly sanctuary, which is a copy of the earthly. The investigative judgment started on that day in heaven. You say, well, why would God announce it? Because you can't see it. Well, God does. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth, and when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Remember that? And then he said this to John. And the commission goes to the same people who lived after that big, bitter disappointment. He said to me, you must prophesy worldwide before many people, nations, tongues, and kings. What we're having here is a church with a commission. Don't keep it in the four walls. Preach it. Teach it. You see, that's the three angels' message. Book of Amos gives a wonderful comment. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. And you can take your whole Bible. When there was a major issue or event, God would announce it. You would expect God to announce it, wouldn't you? You would expect God to announce it to his people. And he would make sure that there was no mistake. And I'll tell you what, there can be no mistake. That sweet, bitter experience plus the commission only fits one people. This church is unique. It is the only church who teaches this. It is the only church that there is a judgment in heaven starting from 1844. And there's the trollop again on, the, on, 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 on that dragon. Remember the angel. The angel said this, come out of her. Who? God's people are to come out of the confusion of Babylon. Come out, but where to? Well, the answer is very clear. You've got to come to the remnant church. And what should that remnant church, God's church, that will march into glory, what would that church teach? It would proclaim the everlasting gospel, for sure. It certainly would have to give and have be the possessor and executor of the Elijah message. Is that true? Folks? Absolutely. It would do that. It would keep the commandments of God, all of them, including number four. It matters to God. And if it matters to him, why should we go against it? It doesn't make sense. They keep the commandments of God. They should prophesy again. They are a people who are preaching this message that you being preached at today this message has to go around the whole world. That's exactly what this church is doing. The identification of the remnant church, can I put it to you, is relatively easy. And it should have the faith or the testimony of Jesus. Now, that's an interesting concept. I want you to remember this. Remember the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. He, Satan, the dragon... When to make war with the rest or remnant of her offspring. You remember that? So he's going to make war with the remnant, and the reason why he's doing that, because they keep the commandments of God, and they have the testimony of Jesus. And he doesn't want that. Now I'm going to show you from Scripture 
what the testimony of Jesus actually means. I'm going to put it to you. It really means to have the spirit of prophecy. I'm going to show you this. In the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation, John gets so overwhelmed by the angel that is showing him everything. This is an ordinary angel that he that he actually kneels, he feels at the he, he falls at the feet of the of the angel to worship him. And the angel says, "No, don't do that." You see? The angels don't want you to do that. He said, "No, don't do that." He said, "Look, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren. Brethren is an old-fashioned word for brothers. He said, I'm one of the brothers. I am, I am a fellow servant. Angels work together with human beings who have the testimony. He's of the brethren he's of, who have the testimony of Jesus. He says, you know, worship God because, he says, the testimony of Jesus is what? Okay, the spirit of prophecy. Does that mean that the people who belong to this church all are all prophets? No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that. But they have the spirit of prophecy. You understand? Of course, you would expect, according to Amos, you would expect God to tell his servants the prophet. You would expect, because Malachi says that he will send a messenger. Now, that may be a movement, but there certainly is a consideration for a prophet here. Now, as we continue, and you come to the 22nd chapter, John is making the same mistake again. He's so overwhelmed, he wants to worship the angel who says, don't do this, for I am your fellow servant and of your brothers, the prophets. That's what he's saying. Worship God and those who keep the words of this book. This book of Revelation is a culmination of all the Bible books together, folks. Very important that we take this very serious. And so, what would it have, the remnant church? Well, it should have the testimony of Jesus, which we understand is the spirit of prophecy. Correct? Yes, it does. Now, here we have Joel. Joel made a prediction. About 700 plus BC, he made this prediction. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit, he says, on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy, he says. Your old man shall dream dreams and your young man shall see visions, he says, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Before the second coming, there is going to be visions. That's what he says. That is predicted. Jesus said this in Matthew 24, verse 24. False Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. What type of prophets? So if there are false prophets, then there must be true prophets. Or at least one true prophet. Because if the Office of prophet is absolute, no longer existent, then all Jesus would say, those who pretend to be a prophet at this time are all false. But he didn't say that. He recommended that we should make a distinction between the true Christ himself and imposters, namely Satan, And that we should make a distinction between the false prophets and the true prophets. You understand this? That's what he's teaching. That is what Jesus is saying. Great signs and wonders. Why? Well, they want to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. The only thing that keeps you on the straight and narrow is to know the word of God. What did Jesus say? What did he teach? You've got to study your Bible. You've got to study your Bible if you don't want to be deceived. A test of a true prophet. Have a look at some of the conditions. Just let's briefly look at that. Absolute accuracy. Not, you know, like the, the, the fortune tellers of today. That's, they have an accuracy of about 16%. That's it. It's disastrous. Keep your money. They have to have 100% accuracy 
true to Scripture. They must be in harmony. If they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inspired all the Bible writers. Is that correct? Therefore, the Holy Spirit would not speak against himself. It must be true to Scripture. Uh, it exalts Jesus. It lifts him up. And, and that's what must happen. They keep the commandments of God. The reason really why the, the office of, of prophet went by the wayside, they stopped keeping those commandments. Fruits of the Spirit, it's got to show. And by the way, they're not there for themselves. They are there for the edifying of the church, like all the other gifts. You study that from the Pauline writings, it become crystal clear. Now, as it happened, as it happened, our church, the Seven Days Adventist Church, had such a person. It's strange. Whenever you try to tell people that God raised up a messenger, prophet if you like, she never called herself that, People become weary. And I don't blame them because you have a number of others, Joseph Smith and Eddie Baker and some of the others. But I've put some conditions there on the board that would qualify the true prophet. And now you've got to look at the person and what they teach. And I want to explain to you why I'm actually standing right here now before you. Firstly, if you take the test of the prophets on this woman, I can assure you she was absolutely accurate in all the predictions. I could spend the day and tomorrow giving you the examples of predictions she made that were true. She certainly predicted in the most unlikely time the rise of the papacy, the return of the papacy. She got that from scripture, of course. She exalts Jesus. Oh, did she that? Absolutely. She always pointed to him. Keep God's commandments. When she learned the truth about the Sabbath and truth about other things, she turned to the truth and she kept it and lived by it. She lived it. She lived it. Fruits of the Spirit, when she died, and you look at some of the obituaries that were written by secular people, people that had nothing to do with the church to which she was so vital, you should see some of the statements. You can Google it uh, on, on the internet. And it is massive, the commentaries that were given in her favor because of the humble person that she was. You see, she withstood all those tests. I'll give you just a couple of little examples, just a couple of little ones. It's interesting. You know, Daniel, in Daniel 2, says that you know, that the European nations would not cling to each other, and we found that still to be true at the last century. Two world wars. She commented on the fact well before it started in 1890 that such an event would find place, reiterated that in 1904 and 1906. She describes balls of fires, navies going down. Uh, to the ocean floor, she described a slaughter, a wholesale warfare, never seen, never seen by men. She used to describe the phenomenon of the warfare that we know as the First and the Second World War. She says, the tempest is coming, we shall see trouble on all sides. Thousands of ships will be hurled into the depths of the sea, navies will go down, and all human, and, and human lives will be sacrificed by... This is at a time when there's only barely 1.4 billion people on this planet. The millions of people that she indicated did indeed perish. 180 million over the whole of the last century by estimate. And we're trying very hard to catch up this century, this century. When you look what we're doing globally now. Signs of the Times, April 21, 1890. That's when she made that statement. She made an interesting statement on San Francisco and Oakland, the earthquake on April the 18th, 1906. A few years beforehand, she made a statement, that tremendous earthquake that took so many lives and was so destructive. She said before, not long hence these cities will suffer under the judgment of God. That was only four years before the event. Perhaps not convincing, but she said that. And this one, I like this one. I'm open to any suggestions, but I want to see what you make of it. 
9-11 changed the world. Would that be true? It did. Of course it did. It has not been the same. Now, we still remember the images. They were horrendous, weren't they? You could never forget them. And the end result, who would have thought? Who would have thought? Now, this is what really interests me. On one occasion, she says, 1905-1906, she wrote that. On one occasion, when in New York City, I was in the night vision called upon to behold buildings rising story after story towards heaven, much higher than they were in her day. She says these buildings were warranted to be fireproof. In her days, buildings were not fireproof. And she says, they were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify the owners and the builders. Higher and higher, still higher, these buildings rose and in them the most costly material was used. Now, I want you to see what she says now. The scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. She says, men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said, they're perfectly safe. Why? Well, they're fireproof. Costly material was used, she said. But these buildings were consumed as made of what made those two towers burn it was the fuel the high octane fuel of the planes they just had taken off they were full of fuel and that fuel caused such a heat when obviously it got ignited and as it burned out of control it affected the insulation of the steel contraption that would keep that building strong and the insulation was meant it was meant to be fireproof but the impact of the planes damaged it and you can heat battle here and it'll be just as hot in due time right over there. Study the incident of 9-11. Exactly. They stood there. They couldn't believe that these buildings were burning. But they were. And nobody expected the collapse of those buildings. Nobody expected that. These firemen had gone in by the huge numbers to save and help people. So many of them perished. And I look at a statement like that. And I'm not being dogmatic, but might it be in vision. She saw what you and I saw on our televisions. You remember where you were when that happened? I was giving a seminar very much like this. When I went home, after me telling all night everybody to believe what I told them, I turned on the television I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw it was a movie. And then, it was real. It was real. I couldn't believe it. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. Is that true on the day? Oh, absolutely. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. It wouldn't work. They couldn't do anything. Terrible what happened. Shocking. Now, of course, he wrote on, if any smokers here, I can help you. Do you know in 1850s, he wrote down that tobacco was an insidious poison. That would, that would rob you of your health. I can give you uh, lectures on what she wrote on health. Whatever she wrote, 
stands today, whatever what was written 150 years ago, stands today as being perfectly true. Whether it is health, whether it is education, whether it is whatever topics he wrote on, it's amazing. The accuracy is incredible. She authored many books, and here are just an, a few of them. And I would have to say, <clears throat> when I came across these books and this story about this woman, and I suppose it's a little bit of a testimony here, I didn't want to become a Seventh-day Adventist. <clears throat> I didn't. So the best way not to become one and not to feel guilty is study the writings of this woman. I mean, she's only a woman. Sorry, girls. None of us here. No, that's right. Now, I studied this. <coughs> By the way, the Bible has many examples of women prophets as well. Now, so I started to read the Conflicts of the Ages series. Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings. And I got the desire of ages, and it knocked me almost over. It bowled me over. And I was there with my Bible, Bibles, looking at things. Acts of the Apostles. And then I read a book, like the Great Controversy. And I go to history, and I check everything. And I go to the websites, and people have this to say about it, people have that to say about it. And what a load of rubbish that comes on those websites sometimes. You've got to find truth, folks. Find out for yourself. And that's what I did. Two and a half years, I looked for a reason to fault her writings. I couldn't. I couldn't. And I could do only one thing. On the basis of what I told you this afternoon, I decided... I go for truth. I'll take truth. And I'll live with it. And that's what I did. And so here we are. Talking to you. Pleading with you to do the same thing. Because folks, there is no other way. Isn't that true? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, we thank you for the truth, we thank you that we can study your word and know that we're on safe and solid ground. I particularly pray for the people here that as they have had a lot to listen to and so many things handed to them today, will you help them to understand, to accept. You can, through your spirit, you can bring that about. Lord, be with these people. Hold us, hold us tight, and that we can feel that touch, that sweetness of your presence. And it stays with us. Let us not depart from you. Let us not move away. Let us stay close. Even if life seems so useless, maybe. The fact is. Your love for us is so great. Lord, we admit that we are poor. Poor in spirit. We have nothing to bring. We have nothing really to show. But we claim the promise that the kingdom of heaven is for each and every one here in this auditorium today. Help us to become what you want us to be. You can do it through your spirit. Bless us. Keep us near to your heart. And Lord, as we have some fellowship and food, bless that fellowship and the food and be with us during the week. Be next to us, near to us, through your spirit in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. 
and we'll see you all next week again.